Good afternoon and hello everyone. My name is Bodo Bukagan and I'm going to talk to you about point clouds in orthophotos. And I'm going to show you some applications that we do in the earth and environmental sciences. Um, what you see down here on the right hand bottom part is a drone view of the campus goal. And I'm going to zoom in to this uh, during this presentation a couple of times. Uh, first, uh, who are we? Uh, we are a group of nine postdocs and six PhD students. Here is a photo of some of us, and we are working with remote sensing data and earth surface processes. So we are not only focused on uh, drone data, but there is a lot of research associated with, with, with um, UAV and drone data that I will be presenting in a little bit. Um, our team and the Institute runs an English language master of remote sensing called Master of Remote Sensing Geoinformation and Visualization with approximately 400 applications each year. We usually supervise around 15 to 20 master theses and all of them focus on remote sensing and a lot of them focus on point clouds and UAV data collection. Um, it's an international program with students from all over the world. About half of them come from Germany and or Europe. Um, our team also gives regular workshops for point cloud processing, and that's what we do together with NASA and the National Science Foundation from the US. A, and those uh, workshops are DFD funded uh, or from the BMVF, and they address uh, PhD students and early career scientists or so junior professors, uh, uh, postdocs. Um, we also frequently collaborate with industry and research partners. Those are, for example, IBM, uh, Planet, a remote sensing company, um, uh, institutes here in Berlin uh, that look at uh, solar panels or, for example, clean air uh, processes. Um, if your company is interested in offering specific internships tailored to master students, uh, please contact me. So today I would like to talk about uh, terrestrial and airborne LiDAR acquisitions, what some of the work that we do, and I would like to focus on point cloud and full waveform analysis. I also will be showing some examples of how we use uh, optical data um, and structure from motion to generate um, three-dimensional three uh, um, three models that we use for uh, environmental assessments. Um, a couple of research examples, um, I will be focusing on lens calibration, where we have set up a nice uh, field here in uh, Gaon. Um, on the other side uh, of Berlin, um, the western, the southwestern side of Berlin, um, as opposed to where most of you are sitting right now. Um, I briefly talk about hyperspectral point clouds, and I showed some examples of how you can segment point clouds to pick out the objects that we are interested in. So quick backup here on uh, what are point clouds and how you can generate point clouds. Um, the typical classical way of generating point clouds and how I learned it 15, 20 years ago was using a LiDAR. Um, these can be airborne, these can be terrestrial, and they can also be mounted on drones. Uh, this is usually a more expensive equipment um, and you are measuring the time of flight usually. And uh, the great advantage of LiDAR remote sensing is that you can penetrate through vegetation. So you can see um, the ground uh, below uh, vegetation because you have multiple returns depending on your diameter of the LiDAR beam. Um, the hype of UAV and drones is mostly associated with structure for motion. Structure for motion is a method that allows you to uh, generate three-dimensional information from overlapping images. So most of the commercial sized drones, they have um, an optical sensor, a photo, a camera, um, and you take uh, photos in very dense precision and those allow you to generate a three-dimensional view. Um, those are fundamentally different uh, processes, but the output, a point cloud, uh, may look similar, but they are fundamental differences because you can look through vegetation with LiDAR, it's a big advantage, but those devices are often heavier and more difficult to control, whereas the structure for motion is a more standard technique that is also widely used in agricultural applications. 
Um, here's an example of an airborne LIDAR flight of our campus in Gomb. Um, uh, the university campus is on this side. We have the Max Planck, Fraunhofer, and other institutions here on the left-hand side. And this is taken from an airplane, uh, roughly 700 meters elevation. This is a former PhD student who now works um, at a company uh, and acquires those uh, flights for us. Um, at the same time, when the airborne LIDAR flight was taken, we also flew a drone with a hyperspectral sensor. Um, um, this is flown from 100 meter uh, elevations, and um, the colors here denote the um, content of um, chlorophyll in the plants. And so the more reddish the color, the less chlorophyll. You see the train tracks here. The more greenish the colors, the higher the chlorophyll content. We are currently optimizing this to also uh, include uh, a better soil moisture. Um, uh, components. So a very detailed high resolution uh, version of, um, uh, uh, of environmental processes. Those of you interested in exploring this online, we have a couple of point clouds for the campus region uh, at the University of Potsdam in Gaum, available at our poetry viewer. So this is an interactive way of uh, uh, visualizing point clouds and also analyzing them uh, in your normal web browser. You can even do it on your handheld uh, camera system. I'm, I'm very happy to paste this, copy and paste that link into the chat after, after this presentation. So what is the equipment that we are using? I just mentioned an airborne lighter flight. Um, we are using um, a bunch of commercial drones uh, for uh, easy to uh, access um, uh, hyperspectral and multispectral imagery. Here on the left-hand side is an example. But we are also using a combination of commercial drones and um, our own self-constructed ground penetrating radar system that we use for um, exploring the subsurface uh, from, um, from a drone. So we fly in five or 10 meters elevation and uh, use a ground penetrating radar system uh, to get the density and water changes in the surface. Uh, for longer and larger scale acquisitions, uh, we are using um, uh, Songbird. Um, some of you may be familiar with this model. Uh, and we have custom made sensors that we designed ourselves and or put together ourselves. This is an example of a 100 megapixel camera, the phase one in here, but we also have an uh, airborne lighter sensor that we could use um, uh, for this. We are using our own system for uh, um, um, correction of the data to make sure that we have the highest possible precision that we are interested in. A couple of examples that I would like to present. This is a view of campus Gong. The scale here is roughly 500 meters on the X and on the Y axis. And the color scale here shows the difference between a good and a bad calibration of a lens. So an off-the-shelf commercial drone, if you are generating an ortho, if you are generating a three-dimensional point cloud from that, um, you will see the classical warping that you have because many of the lenses are not well calibrated. This warping may maybe uh, on the order of a couple of centimeters up to meters. Here the scale is up to two meters. So um, I'm showing this example uh, uh, to tell you that um, without careful calibration of the optical uh, sensors, uh, your output point cloud will not be accurate. Um, this has to do with the distortions of the lens. I'm not going into detail here. I just wanted to point out that we have uh, designed and set up a system on the campus GOM uh, to calibrate these um, uh, optical sensors. And we have permanently mounted markers on the top of the roof and, you know, pretty much a meter to the left of this, uh, uh, you would be uh, at least 20 meters lower. And we have a high relief contrast that we can use to uh, properly address uh, the optical structures of the of the drone. So we use this uh, for all of the sensors, including our um, colleagues who fly uh, sensors from the university to calibrate our uh, structures. We also have a permanently mounted GPS station. Um, this is one of them. We have another one on another roof. This is somewhat similar to the talk that we just have seen um, uh, a couple of minutes ago uh, uh, with the uh, GNSS systems in Berlin. We also have a set of very uh, precise reference points on the campus GOM. We use the campus GOM as, a, as our natural laboratory uh, to calibrate some of those uh, lenses. So this is um, our local uh, calibration site. 
a lot of the research that we do um, um, in Potsdam is actually located in the uh, Park Salsa Sea. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, that is uh, one of the more classic buildings that we have in uh, in Potsdam. And this is an example of a hyperspectral uh, point cloud also flown by a former PhD student. And we are closely working with the Stiftung Preußischer Schlüsse in Gärten because they have mapped all 25,000 trees in that, um, in that park. And we are um, uh, using that data set uh, um, to identify individual trees. And just to show two research examples here that we do with the ecologists um, in different departments, we are opting optimizing algorithms to um, detect individual trees, and uh, we use point clouds for that. So this is not an orthophoto. This is an, um, uh, this particular example is taken from an airborne LiDAR point cloud, but we also use structure for motion uh, data for this. I'm not going into the details here, uh, but this is an approach that uh, is better suited for uh, individual trees uh, that can be well separated. Uh, we are also looking at the network structure of trees. So we use each of the points each of the return points, and we are building a network, and then we are essentially reconstructing, resembling uh, the tree, um, so that we can identify individual trees, even if they're overlapping. So this is an example here um, from the Neues Palais, where we have a lot of trees that are fairly close to each other, and that then uh, becomes more difficult uh, to distinguish between, between those trees. Uh, for this particular example, we use a fusion of uh, airborne, um, lighter and uh, uh, hyperspectral data that adds additional information um, uh, and helps us to distinguish between the different tree structures. Another example here from uh, the Andes in South America. Um, um, one of the questions that we are trying to address here is how coarse, how rough are rivers, because that heavily influences the flooding um, a potential that rivers have. And in that example here, we are using a mast mounted um, camera, but we also have flown drones for exactly the same region. And what we do is uh, we have uh, derived um, an algorithm and a carefully tested approach to, ident to identify individual pebbles. So we are doing the pebble counting, um, that's a fairly tedious task. We are doing this uh, via UAV acquired images um, and have uh, uh, made this publicly available on our GitHub account and uh, published this in peer reviewed journals. We are currently trying to investigate the usage of uh, point clouds for that, not only orthophotos. Um, uh, the issues that we are currently facing is that um, we need to have, um, when we are using um, when we are using drone data for this, uh, we need to make sure that we have multiple angles. And uh, that becomes a long flight time. And at that point, the drone acquisition um, is limited by the, by the battery time. Here are two examples um, of a very dense point cloud on the right-hand side and a coarser one on the left-hand side. And I'm just showing how sparse um, a point cloud is that is derived from only top view images and on the right hand side is an uh, example of a much denser uh, point cloud. The last example that I would like to give is uh, for waveform LiDAR data. Um, so you all know that uh, you're sending off a signal uh, from a LiDAR and then we obtain a return signal. And then usually in 99% of the cases, you just turn that return signal in a single point. So you take that return signal, which is a continuous wave, and you identify a single point, which then is your point cloud. But that signal, that return signal, contains a lot of information. And we are after that information of, of that signal. So for example, if you have um, um, your LiDAR beam uh, hitting a, a flat ground, you get a very spiky return signal. If your uh, ground uh, is tilted, uh, or uh, if your LiDAR beam is larger than the object that you're observing, you're getting different shapes. And we are after identifying those uh, different shapes. So what we have done is we have uh, returned to our campus GOM here. This is the building that I'm currently in at, by the way. Um, and this is a fusion of an uh, airborne LiDAR data set and a drone data set. And I'm going to show you what a single beam, a single beam going through this tree here looks like. So this 
is a single beam and we collect 800,000 of those per second, um, um, a single beam looks like this. So we are getting multiple returns uh, while the LiDAR beam travels uh, through um, uh, the tree. And those individual return signals that we see here, we can um, um, use to better identify uh, objects. For example, we can more readily identify uh, um, vegetation from trees or solar panels from other structural uh, uh, parts of the building. And Here's an example of using the structural tensor approach in voxels, where we have um, uh, used uh, the combination of multiple flight directions uh, to identify uh, how well behaved that signal is within a voxel. And uh, the colors here indicate linear return signals, meaning a fairly flat area, um, uh, isotropic return signals, meaning that the signal is broader and scatters more. Um, that is mostly uh, the case for uh, the vegetation. So we can readily identify vegetation without using any additional optical color information. So that's, that's important um, that we could, can only rely on that single the LIDAR signal. Um, uh, just two other top views that we have here. This is uh, only plotting the flat component, and the flat component um, is something that allows us uh, to identify the outlines uh, of the buildings because these are the nicely very leveled um, areas. And um, taking the isotropic component into account, the isotropic component is a component where um, the reflections go in all direction in the voxel space, and these are for in this particular example related to uh, the vegetations. So, so these were the examples that I wanted to uh, give you, and I'm happy to take any questions.